First of all, I will introduce myself. My name is Julia Martin and I'm a program manager with ARDC. Despite my unusual uh, labelling in the window, um, I'd like to welcome you all for attending today and thank you very much for your time, especially for those who are going to present today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which you all live and work. I'd now like to hand over to Shada Hadavi to provide an overview of the Public Sector Bridges Programme. Hi everyone. So before we will get to each project's presentation, I thought it would be good to provide an overview on the Public Sector Bridges Program. And the Public Sector to Research Sector Bridges Program is one of the six programs on the ARDC's uh, National Data Assets Initiative. Julia, we went one slide ahead. Um, so the objective of the National Data Assets Initiative is to establish a strategic partnership with research communities to be able to develop long-lived data assets. Our motivating principle is that a collection of data can be a national research infrastructure when they support leading-edge research and they are national in scale. Next. Um, the aim of the Public Sector to Reach a Sector Bridges program is to extend or improve public sector data to better support leading edge research. The activities in these projects include implementing data standards, extending collections, developing access interfaces, establishing new governance, policy and access arrangements, and connecting with research infrastructure and analytical tools. Um, next. So the program objective basically is to address data needs of researchers and provide research requirement scenarios to the public sector to be able to align the public sector and research outcomes and improve public policy, administration and service delivery. So that's it for the program overview. Uh, my colleague Julia Martin will be taking over as the program manager of the public sector bridges program as I move to other ARDC's program. So I will hand back to you, Julia. Thanks, Shada. Um, I just, before we start, I want to remind the presenters that we do have three minutes to um, present each. It will go very, very quickly. And Shada will let you know if you have approached your three minutes. Um, and I'd like to welcome Roger Ward. Um, Roger, are you going to be presenting? You're on mute at the moment. I'll. Apologies. Um, uh, Dougie was planning uh, to present. Are we first up or? You are first up. Ah, Dougie's just arrived actually. So. Uh... Right. Yeah. Good timing. First in, uh, Dougie. Projects exchange right now. Tristan, so I'll need to get going. All right, cheers, mate. Bye for now. All right. Um, Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. For our first presentation, we have um, Professor Dougie Boyle, and he will be presenting on the hospital EMR data as a national data asset for research project. Okay. Thanks very much. If we can have the next slide, then that'd be terrific. Okay, so um, I think I'm really excited about this project. Um, the sort of challenge we have here is is um, healthcare data. This is so this is a healthcare data project, and uh, data in health and in particular in the hospitals for this project is collected across different electronic medical record systems. Um, and invariably what happens is if, if someone wants access to this data for research, um, it takes IT departments a long time to pull together the data that's in a request. It costs a lot of money. The governance is a real challenge. Sometimes it can take you 
months or years to access your data. Um, so what this project is about is trying to set some of the foundations for how we can um, try to move towards common data models, um, potentially at a national scale. So this is a really enabler. It's not going to try and change all of Australia, but it's an enabler based on uh, the two main electronic medical record systems that are used in Australia, which are Cerner and Epic. Um, and the, the further challenge with these systems is that they evolve over time and they're not even the same between one hospital and another if they're on the same platform. So if we can have the next slide, thanks. So I mentioned the word common data model. So uh, what you're looking at here are some different country plugs on the left, and that's a um, visually, I guess, what data is like um, across our uh, across healthcare in Australia. It is all held in different formats, and this project is to uh, prove that we can convert this into one model. And in fact, the model we've chosen is an international model, which is, is probably the most widely implemented common data model in the world, uh, which is the this OMOP common data model. Uh, feel free to look up OMOP, you'll, you'll find it online, rather than me worrying about describing in the short presentation what it is. But if you can move on to the next slide, thanks. So the thing about this common data model is um, because what it really amounts to is you've got tables and fields of data and about 12 of them instead of thousands of tables um, that you have in electronic medical record systems. So the data is much more consistent and easy to understand. And what it means then is researchers, if you have data in this common data model, it's easier to request the same data from different groups. But more importantly, you can actually run, you can ask for your queries to be run on top of this data and just get the results back. So it means that hospitals and the IT departments don't need to give you out all of the individual data with consent issues and governance issues that that presents. It means that um, you can just get the results of your analysis back. And uh, a lot of international COVID-19 work has been able to be turned around very fast using this technique because they've been able to ask the same question um, across um, hundreds of millions of individuals having COVID-19 tests um, around the world, which is fascinating. Um, so what this does then is open up the hospital data to be able to contribute across international communities. But in this um, environment, there's free training internationally, and there are a huge number of tool sets on top of this for doing things like case control studies, cohort studies, whatever it is you might want to do, visualization, data quality assessment. People have done all this for you. So common model, it's easy to work with, the training's all available, and the outcome is faster and easier access to data and research outcomes. And it spans not just hospitals, across the, the country, we're also converting primary care data and other data sources, administrative data sources. So ultimately, it just gives us huge uplifting capability nationally. And the idea with this project is we'll share everything openly to support the next hospital to do this sort of conversion. Thanks. Thank you, Dougie. That's fantastic. Mm. The next person we'll hear from is Associate Professor Philip Chung from UNSW Law and Justice to talk about the National Free Access Coronary Findings Recommendations and Responses Project. Uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, thanks, everyone. So for us, it's actually uh, uh, very excited and um, very fortunate. We feel that we were able to um, be funded to work on this particular project because um, from our research into this area in terms of looking at uh, infrastructure uh, data sets from for law, uh, what we discovered was there's a major gap in terms of having access to the coronial uh, ingress findings um, generally. Uh, as we know, coroners actually investigate the cause and circumstances of the of reported deaths. So a lot of their recommendations and findings 
uh, very important in terms of public policy and looking at changes into the law itself. I'm sure many of you are aware of some of the major ones like the health, uh, policing, uh, and I guess in particular of particular interest to us is the best in custody uh, implications that's been going on for many years. But what we discovered when we're looking at uh, providing access to the coronial findings and recommendations is that they are very state and uh, based. So in other words, they're localized, the way information is maintained, uh, the system itself, how uh, the whole coronial process work is different between various states and territories in Australia. So the uh, one of the key challenges for us is that to say, well, first of all, are we able to even find access to the findings it, uh, themselves? Okay, so one of the big aspect of uh, the gap that we have managed, we identify here is actually having access to the, the raw documents, the actual findings themselves to begin with. And even for those that are available, they're generally not linked necessarily to the other resources that are relevant uh, to the process, like the cases, uh, the government policies and the legislation uh, reforms uh, that resulted from them. Uh, and the other uh, interesting aspect to coronial findings and recommendations is that a lot of them are being directed to government agencies. And there's generally a requirement for government agencies to respond within a few months uh, of those findings. Um, but again, uh, generally it's very difficult uh, to find those responses. And even if they're available, they're not necessarily linked back to the regional recommendations. So as you can see from these brief explanations, there are a lot of information gaps to begin with. So that's one of the key aspects that we would like to uh, target in this particular project. Can I have the next slide, please? The solution we're looking at is to, first of all, locate and work with the corners across the country. Uh, so as part of this project that uh, we were very happy about is that all the coroners have agreed to be member uh, to be project partners in this. So we feel that we have a really good chance to actually make a difference in terms of how uh, coronial findings and recommendations are made available uh, across Australia. So that the hope is to actually uh, get in one talking and let's agree on at least a process, if not a com common format in which the information is provided. So what we'd like to achieve from these uh, uh, projects is to make them available through OSLI. Uh, just very quickly, uh, OSLI has, is a legal uh, data, uh, website with uh, over 800 databases of Australasian uh, legal information, cases, legislation, law journals, treaties, law reform, et cetera. So what we like to do with this particular project is to incorporate uh, documents through, uh, from the coronial uh, inquest process, including findings, recommendations, and the responses from government. And, and as part of this, have them linked through to the other uh, types of legal information uh, that's available to OSLI. Now, one of the key things we, we would like to do is to assign uh, what we call neutral citations to each of the documents that gets incorporated, which uh, then allows for better uh, um, discoverable process later on, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But generally, what we're trying to do here is to identify the resources, if necessary, digitize them, because a lot of them might still be in print, and even the uh, coroners themselves may not have access to them. So we're talking about a quite a significant, uh, in some jurisdiction, uh, information gaps there that we're trying to address. And as part of this process throughout the, the project is to develop better processes and procedures for ongoing um, um, editions of the new findings. Can I move to the next slide, please? Now, once we have access to the content and we are able to incorporate them on, onto the OSLI platform, uh, what we feel is that it would be uh, such a major uh, and significant um, inclusion to OSLI, but also in terms of the data access more generally. Because one of the things that uh, having the platform accessible, through, uh, having the data accessible through OSLI is that currently OSLI has about 25% of the legal research market uh, in Australia. So one of the things at a minimum, what we can say is the data will be a lot more accessible and it will be integrated into the overall legal eco uh, system that we have as part of the OSLI uh, database through, as I said, legislation cases, journals and treaties, et cetera. But the, the key thing about this, though, is that it's actually important for not just the lawyers or the legal sector involved, 
is also useful for the community law centers that are helping individuals that are impacted by these. It also helps other scholars from other uh, um, uh, faculties in terms of their own research in the humanities, social sciences, criminology, maybe even health. So we think that uh, as a whole, uh, making access to the colonial uh, findings, uh, recommendations, and responses would actually enhance accountability and transparency. Because after all, one of the reasons for having a coronal inquest is to figure out what happened and to prevent that from happening again. So we think that to us is a major investment in the rule of law in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. That was fantastic. Next, we will be hearing from Dr. Lu Jin from Atlas of Living Australia on the sensitive species data pathways for research and decision making. Uh, thank you all very much for this great opportunity. So uh, basically what we're looking at is the what we, what we call the sensitive or threatened species kind of data, which are the occurrence records of species across Australia. And then this kind of species usually uh, sort of sorted into two categories uh, when we think about it. One of them is the threatened species, uh, which are which are mostly native species that may be impacted by developments like mining or, or uh, uh, properties and that kind of stuff. The other one is exotic species, which are external, sort of outside of Australia species that might impact local uh, uh, local environment. So this kind of species that are used widely across a uh, number of issues, for example, biodiversity, climate change, or uh, especially for the EPPC Act assessment, which is related to the local developments and other things, for example, bushfire recovery and then biosecurity issues. So there's some issues sort of centered around this uh, kind of data at the moment. One of them is uh, the biggest one is they kind of uh, stored in silo. So they uh, each state jurisdiction holds their own data or territory. Uh, they're not really shared among them. And the researchers who collect this data also sort of hold it to themselves. They don't really sort of share it out. And, and the, the reason of that is mostly because there's not a, a great agreeable framework for them to share it. Um, most people just hold it to themselves. And then the sort of the limited data is being shared that is often denatured, which means that the data is not really uh, exact uh, for the locations of the species, which creates issues for people actually making assessments or research that they don't know really know where the where the species are in terms of when they do modelings and make policy decisions that kind of stuff. Thank you, uh, Julia. Please next slide. So the solutions we're looking at is really because people hold data in silos. So we want to unite all the partners in here and then to find the solutions uh, within the Gravel framework. So the partners that we have, for example, AIBC, and we have gathered all the states and territory jurisdictions, and with CSIRO and Western Australia, WOPSI, um, the Charnch FC, which represent the museum and collections community, and also Ecocommerce Australia, which does the analytics, and POSI Supercomputer, which provides the um, infrastructure for us. And then we're really looking at three different aspects sort of solving this problem. One of them is a national framework for sensitive species data that we uh, ratify an agreement to share this kind of things under uh, certain circumstances that everybody's happy. Uh, second thing we want to have is what we call a sensitive species data service. So hopefully that people can through this service and, and access the data which is being shared across uh, state jurisdiction, uh, state territory jurisdictions. The other one is also provide a technical environment for people to do modeling. Um, thank you, Julia. Please next slide. And the impacts that we're looking at are sort of a different uh, realm. Uh, this will greatly improve the efficiency of environment assessments. So which in turn will uh, help our sort of economic development activities, especially centered around natural resources, for example, mining, uh, reducing the green tape in this kind of uh, circumstances, and also reduce the biodiversity risk, sorry, biosecurity risk, since uh, we know more, we know more about this species. And also protect sort of the natural environment better, and then uh, sort of help the research of climate change, and then uh, species recovery kind of activities. And also, hopefully, this will also uh, uh, this will because it sort of does better for economy, and then the environment it will help with the um, quality of life of our people, and then uh, sort of uh, make a more sustainable sort of a human environment interactions. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. Um, our next presenter today is Ivan Hannigan, who will talk to the Integrated National Air Pollution and Health Data Project. Thank you. Yes. And I uh, just wanted to um, 
point to my organization, the Center for Air Pollution, Energy and Health Research, being the national uh, consortium of health and environmental um, uh, interested researchers to spearhead a national approach to this problem. And the problem basically is air pollution is bad for you. Uh, and the other thing to note just is air pollution is some of air pollution is avoidable. The stuff that humans create is uh, appreciable. And I point to our recent paper published just a couple of months ago. We looked at the avoidable amount of death in Australia that could be um, avoided if the uh, human emissions of air pollution was stopped. Now, obviously, uh, that costs a lot of money. So we put that benefit also in terms of money. So we found that a couple of thousand deaths per year, which added up to $6.2 billion just in terms of the value of a statistical life. And that's a, a very low estimate of the health cost. So that's where the problem lies, puts the amount of deaths in the same kind of bucket as road deaths and suicide, which are also avoidable. Now, what we can do about it is to move sensitive buildings like hospitals and schools away from air pollution hotspots. And that's an urban planning thing that we can do. But then the data is also needed to guide things like prescribed burns for bushfire management. And the bottom left, the bottom right hand image is a bushfire reduction burn, hazard reduction burn that uh, sent a lot of smoke over Sydney. So that uh, just demonstrates what we can do about it if we uh, make these adjustments. But there's a cost associated. So I'll go to the next slide, which is the solution is to give policymakers evidence based uh, decision support tools that give you a robust estimate of the health costs under the baseline business as usual case, and then scenarios that they could uh, imagine if they had made some kind of policy or intervention. So this diagram shows what would be needed and what we propose to build to, to integrate the environmental and health data. And on the left is the health and the population and exposure um, side of the system. And we've got the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare on board and the Bureau of Statistics will be providing data. And then you've got the registrars of births, deaths and marriages involved as well. On the right hand is the air pollution agencies and the states and territories manage the air pollution data collection. There's no national uh, uh, overview. And so we're gonna work with each of the agencies that are listed there to bring together the first national air pollution data collection. And just to the left of that is the spatial model. We're gonna work with things like satellite data and complicated mathematical simulation models to develop exposure surfaces, which we will link with the health data. And that's where the two lines come together along with epidemiological knowledge about what happens when you expose uh, people to certain levels. And then we'll generate scenarios and have an interactive map uh, for those people to assess what the difference would be. So that's the impact. And the next slide, I just wanted to show visually that the impact is not only for epidemiologists who need this kind of data to do their primary studies of what is the relationship between air pollution and health outcomes. And there's a range of different health outcomes. We still need to know more about um, prenatal, uh, prenatal conditions um, and births and, and so forth. But once we've got those statistics, we can plug them into this analysis where you can imagine that a change in the pollution levels and then calculate what kind of population exposure you would get under that scenario and then calculate the health impact, both as the number of people who died in those small areas or the, the dollars in a range of different ways. So that's, that's really the important social benefit that we're hoping to achieve with this um, public sector bridges project. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan. Looking forward to the outcomes of this project as well. Um, next, we have Shada, who will give an overview of leveraging data to support young people's education and wellbeing project. Um, the Telethon Kids Institute couldn't present today, so Shada will give an overview on their behalf. 
Yeah, I'm presenting on behalf of Spali Brinkman, who couldn't be here today, so I thought I would provide a brief overview on the project. Um, so the challenge this, process, this project is trying to address is a lack of evidence-based understanding of young people's well-being over time. Well-being data have different aspects, such as school attendance, engagement, and academic achievements. The data sets are not connected, and they are held in different state government departments and data is not available in an accessible and comprehensive form. So basically data quality, linkage and governance are some of the key challenges this project is aiming to address. Next slide, please. Um, the solution they're offering is to link educational record from multiple databases over time. The data includes student enrollment and attendance, behavior management, well-being and engagement, disability, access to services and academic achievement. The project will start in South Australia and it will be extended to Tasmania, Western Australia, and probably Australian Capital Territory. Not only they will be linking the different uh, databases, but all of them will be evaluated to meet the quality standards and they will be documented. Next slide. Given the importance of young generations well-being, this uh, project has great impact. So by providing, uh, by improving the awareness, documentation, and timely access to linked data, this project will enable us to provide, an, it, this project will provide an understanding of how our education system is performing. We would be able to plan targeted prevention and intervention initiatives, and we will be able to evaluate the effect of these interventions delivered in schools. And we will be able to monitor and report on the impacts of events such as the pandemics or bushfires. Researchers, governments, policymakers, and our future society and economy are all beneficiaries of these impacts. That's it for my brief overview. Julia, I'll hand back to you.